Okay, uh, so so my talk I think ended 20 minutes ago. Uh, so we're Just starting. Question. Just question. Yes. Uh, so I'll take questions for for the next talk. Okay, so um, uh, this is joint work with Shweta and Rio, who was our visitor from Japan last year, and. Uh, uh, this picture kind of, uh, we had a discussion from uh, Shweta about CNF architecture and its various nice features like hop by hop transport and, and uh, there's some other features that I keep tapping this space for. Opportunistic transmission, caching of popular content, all of these things are good. Um, uh, and, and at the core of this CNF architecture is this kind of caching router that does in-network storage and temporary storage of content to facilitate disconnection or congestion and buffering for hop-by-hop -hop transit. And, uh, and what this talk is about is thinking about using this caching router for, for, um, for uh, providing better service or personal content delivery for intermittently connected mobile users. So in this CNF architecture, it's kind of a no-brainer win for, for using this for popular content. It's not so clear whether you can use this same cache space for personal content that only, only you will want to look at, right? That there's no benefit in the router caching it for, for someone else who will be coming by. So, so we're gonna look at this question. So, so here's the, the gist of the talk. If you have this picture in mind, this is what the talk is about, uh, this cartoon. So maybe we'll replay this cartoon at 4.10 for people who come in late. So, uh, so there's a mobile on the left that wants this, this movie from Netflix. And, and it goes hop by hop through a CNF architecture. And then before, before the, the movie makes it over there, uh, the, the mobile disconnects and wanders off. Kind of a kind of thing. You do a big download, right? You know, you you like, do I do this download now? I might be wandering off, right? Maybe you do it, or maybe you don't. But here, you're wandering off. So so now you disconnect. And now the result of hop by hop transport is that a couple copies of this movie are cached somewhere in the network, right? So so what should we do with that? Right? Is there any value in that? Is it? Uh, should they just discard it and, and when the mobile connects somewhere else, the, we start again from the original server? So, so here's what happens, right? Um, uh, when the mobile disconnects, the, 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 this guy here, he says, oh, the, the mobile isn't there anymore. I won't complete that last copy. Instead, he goes and informs the post office, this agent for, for the mobile customer, that says, I've got the movie he wants. Right, it's it's over here in the network, and and uh, the post office makes this entry for mobile M1 movie one at, at router C is is happens to be there at some time. So so what happens now? So the mobile reconnects, uh, goes to his post office, requests the content. The the post office gives him a pointer to where the movie is, and if you watch this this brilliant animation, uh, the movie got delivered from this from this cache copy and so uh, so it seems very good we saved a couple hops right that's that's the idea so um, uh, so in an ideal network what do you have well you have maybe unlimited cache storage you just keep caching everything everywhere right because space is unlimited uh, on reconnection you you may be asked the post office, uh, where is my file cached? It's cached in many places, and they choose one that might be the best by some metric, and maybe you maximize the probability of a delivery. Maybe you choose the closest cache. Uh, it does good things for the probability in the next attempt that the file is delivered, and it does good things for reducing the network load. So, so that's an ideal world. And in practice, right, these uh, cache capacity is going to be finite, uh, personal content is hard to track, right? It's like, oh, it's just for you. And, and uh, a lot of people are creating personal content around the network. And, and how does, the, how does the, the, the router decide which things to keep, right? None of these things have popularity metrics. Yeah, Leo. Two, two more dimensions, security and authentication. Oh, we prevent other bad guys reaching to your private content. So, so the the answer is that's that's kind of uh, uh, the question you ask if you determine whether 
whether you can actually do anything good here. So if this works, and maybe by the end of the talk, you'll be like, oh, I should work on this. So, so I, you know, that's not my kind of research, honestly. So, so the question is, is this, can you do something useful here in terms of caching? So, um, uh, so, so here, you know, the, when you have lots of personal content, right, and uh, you can easily waste your cache space no matter how big it is. So, so how do you, how do you uh, optimize that? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I have a quick question. I want to draw a distinction between personal content and personalized content. In the example that you made, the content is of general interest, <coughs> but in the sense that other people may be interested. No, in no, so I'm, this movie is really just of interest to you. Okay, so the, this it's is the movie of your kid yeah. in your backyard from last summer. Right. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's your content. It's, uh, uh, Which made it to Netflix for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Someday Netflix, you may store your things. I mean, you don't, you know, the fact is I have a lot of personal content at Google, right? That <coughs> it's, you know, and right there, no maybe. <laughs> right, I, I thought it was personal. Wow. It, the fact is that I may have some kind of uh, uh, storage in the network for my personal <coughs> content. It's Facebook, for example. Facebook, for example, Facebook. right? And, that's a borderline example. But, but one can imagine, right, that we offload our, our storage of our own content to the network for a variety of reasons. Okay, so, so here is the, the recap, right? Mobile users connect via access networks. Uh, they request personal content, typically a large file. Before the content actually goes, hop by hop gets delivered, and the mobile moves and disconnects, later reconnects at a new location. What happens to the content in transit? Which routers to cache the file? How should the old content be discarded? So, um, I have a spoken question. Can you, in this kind of model, does one organization own and operate the whole system? Oh, no. That, that's kind of in, in, this, uh, in this item here. Cache rules need to be local, right? You can imagine, so, so I'll come back to this. So, so first thing is that, Caches need to be selected, right? Uh, uh, what you need for a cache to be useful is that when the mobile terminal reconnects, somebody has to still have that file in the cache. If somehow the file has been discarded before the person reconnects, then, then the cache didn't do anything useful. So, um, uh, so the idea here is that if you think about the expected lifetime of a file in the cache, and you compare that to the average mobile away time, how long the mobile's gone while he's disconnected. You better have, have, you can't have this expected lifetime be a lot less than the away time. In that case, caches are useless, right? So, so caches have to have rules for deciding what things to keep in the hopes that they might be useful 10 minutes or an hour from now to, to this person. So uh, the next thing is that cache rules need to be local. So, so as Chip asks, what's the scope of this? And you know, if you formulate this as kind of an optimization problem, you might look at the global network state, like all the places in the network that this file is cached, the, the loads on various links, the, the routing tables around the network, uh, uh, and try to optimize over that. And you realize, like, first off, it's, it's, it's uh, hopelessly complex. Secondly, it doesn't reflect the fact that these caches are likely to be in, in, um, uh, in, um, uh, uh, um, in different domains and in different networks, right? So, so the caches are operated by, by different service providers, right? And maybe they will not coordinate. So, so, uh, uh, so the fact is we have to come up with a way of doing this that, that the cache rules are local, right? So, so here's our approach that, that respects this idea. The, um, uh, the caches themselves will just do something simple. They'll use least recently used caching rules. So uh, when, you, when a cache is full, and, and after a long time it'll always be full, right? You want to cache something new, you discard the least recently used thing. You don't need to look at the network state. You don't need to ask any questions. You, you use LRU. So, um, uh, and then the second part of this is what we're going to do to, to is we'll identify some cache storage rules so that LRU works as a cache deletion policy. Right? So, 
So the rules for how to decide to cash, we're, we're going to try to, to, to do something to make LRU work. So, so, so now you think, well, what are some cash storage rules that you might, you might consider? Leo, yeah. There is a little contradiction here. Suppose it's really personal, you download it just once. So will you, with this list uh, access cache deleted first, you will have lots of stuff, new arrivals, which were never accessed before, being deleted before something which was already used once and probably will never use it again. Well, so, so the question is, what does used mean, right? Used Access. also includes, well, that's not so clear. You could also include used, meaning you get a timestamp when it arrives. So, so something that arrives after, right, is, is newer. It's more recently used. It so was used placed. So used doesn't equate doesn't to just, how many times no. you download the disk. No, no, it's, it's, you get a timestamp for each time it, it, I, when it shows up or, and then you, when it's requested. So, so, um, uh, so you need a stocking horse, and maybe a stocking horse is you just cache everything. It shows up, file, you cache it, right? And you use LRU to discard data. Uh, another example is to say something maybe a little smarter, possibly, is last node caching. So the last guy who gets the file, he caches it, and when he looks up and he checks and sees that where his next hop should be, and he, he finds out that the mobile is disconnected. He says, nah, I'm holding, holding this. I'm the last guy. I'll cash it. Right? So, uh, uh, so that's a kind of a sensible local policy. Uh, and then the, uh, an alternate policy is one where we'll just do random caching. Random caching is you flip a coin, and with probability p, you cache the object. Right? And, and uh, uh, what that probability should be, we'll discuss in a moment. And then finally, we'll talk about a, a cash pricing mechanism, a mechanism where, where, uh, where there's a price for using a cash at a particular router, and each file is associated with a willingness to pay for caching services. So, so yes? So I think that you just want to fill up your cash and then start deleting stuff that is of least use. So that's how the cache will work. But the question is, how fast should you fill your cache? Maybe you shouldn't fill it too fast. Because the fact is, if you fill it too fast, you replace things before they ever get to be useful for people reconnecting. Right? That's sort of the idea. So, so here's how random caching works. Uh, Node I caches a file with some probability CI. And, and, uh, and you can think, yes? So actually, what you just say is a very valid point on that, that you know you can be in a situation that you have some information that is maybe used in the wild soon actually, but because you the turnaround in your cache is so fast, you have no chance to cache anything. Right. But usually, what happens in reality is actually the the source of the content usually have information about the popularity of the content. Oh, well, these these things so don't have popularity because well, how is to say you know your movie and. You're a movie. You might be the only one who watches it. Yeah, that's true. But actually, most of the time, you would like to use to cache not something that you maybe someone will use it only once. But we want to cache something. You need priorities to so that there be. In that case, you right. So, so you know, there's been a lot of work, right, that exploits the popularity of files and the, the frequency with which things are used. This is really looking at the most extreme case where where you don't have those metrics. Right? So. You know, your question is, well, maybe you can't do it in the use of it. So, yes? Sorry, one question on the previous one. On the last one, caching is under, uh, if there's a rule that, that is used for it, other than your last one, or are you expecting feedback? Oh, or? so in this hop by hop transport, right? Each time you, you get the file, you, you look and say, where's the next hop? And you send a few packets ahead to, to the endpoint to make sure he's still there. Right, and if he's not there anymore, then you're like, mm -hmm. you don't want to do, you don't want to send the file to the next top if the next top is to a place where, where no, you know, that's not on the route to anywhere. So, so um, uh, there's some elementary queuing here, right? Which is if the the cache i is capacity n i and files arrive at rate lambda i, you can apply Little's law to this thing. There's always n i files there. The thing is always full in steady state. And uh, the time a file spends in the system then is is the number of files divided by the rate at which files are put into the into the into the cache. 
right? So, so, so Little's law here gives us uh, an insight. It says you can choose this cash <coughs> probability, right, to to choose this expected lifetime of an object in the cache. So you just randomly caching things. You're randomly thinning the rate at which you admit things to the cache in order that the cache lifetime is useful, right? So if you know typically that these mobile customers are are reconnecting after an hour, you choose the caching probability so the expected lifetime of a file is on the order of an hour in the cache. So, so that's the, the first idea. And this is, uh, we'll compare this. So, Roy, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. You're talking about uh, lifetimes in the cache of the order of an hour. Uh, and the language is couched in uh, uh, one directional, unidirectional caching. But if this is personal content, how likely is it that someone will simply want to download contents and not update it, modify it, and upload it? it you know, personal contents is stuff like uh, Word files that you're working on or stuff like that. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh, is this uh, readily modifiable for uh, reverse ca caching, or mm. do you have a whole big dimension of additional trouble? If uh, so, so. Um, uh, the notion of an hour reflects the this sort of model that says, and maybe it's not an hour, maybe it's a minute, right? Maybe it's a couple minutes, right? It reflects the time scale of personal mobility. So I'm not so sure that which is the time scale of, oh, you're you're near an access point, and then maybe you're near another access point a few minutes later, right? It might be you had to walk a block before before this happens. Um, uh, you're right that, that, that the applications for this are not so well defined in the sense that uh, most of the things you think about downloading in this way are more in the popular content vein of YouTube videos and, uh, and, and not your own videos. But, but uh, 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 I have to say um, uh, I'm not the best guy at dreaming up applications, right? But, but I, I think this is not completely implausible. So. Um, uh, so, so back on, on the sort of the analysis of this, this cash pricing idea is, is the following. The, uh, a user who is going to, to request his file, he specifies, and it's attached to the file, kind of an acceptable price, QJ, for caching that file, right? And different users specify different acceptable prices. And meanwhile, each router sets a caching cost PI, right, which says, uh, I'm going to charge price PI at router I to cash, right? And I'm going to adjust this price so that my cash lifetime is useful. So, so now here's what happens: that uh, when this file passes that router, right? If the the cost of caching at that router is less than the acceptable price, right? The file gets cached. Right? So, so uh, and now what the router does is it sets its its cash price to be kind of the the uh, the minimum price, right, that uh, for the traffic it sees that ensures that the expected lifetime of the cache is longer than this away time. So, so it uses cache pricing in the same kind of vein that we just used random coin flipping before. But uh, there are some differences. This cache pricing mechanism enables user selectivity. So, uh, so, so now you have the possibility that. There are people, the people who, who are stressed in this system are people who when they go to um, an access network, they're there for only a short time, like they're highly mobile users. And they're likely to leave quickly before they're able to get their content, right? So those people, they, they have trouble downloading their files, right? And maybe if they are willing to specify uh, high acceptable prices, they can they can get themselves some improved service. Whereas other people who their mobility is low and they'll spend a long time at a at an access point, uh, they know they're going to be they, they don't pay anything because because the uh, there's no benefit. Eventually, they'll, they'll always get their file just by the normal hop by hop mechanism. So. Uh, uh, so that's the idea of cash pricing, is it, it provides the, the same kind of thinning, but it provides it in a, a uh, uh, with user selectivity. Okay, so, so uh, do any of these things work? Um, so, so here's our simulation setup. It's, uh, we, we have this kind of stub and transit network. So uh, 
Uh, we have a ring of eight transit nodes that are kind of like a high-speed backbone, and to each of these is attached a stub network, which is uh, lower speed. The backbone is everything runs at a gigabit per second. The stubs, all the links run at 100 megabits per second. The files are a gigabyte in size. It makes, makes the math very easy, right? Because a file takes eight seconds in a transit link, and it takes 80 seconds in a... In a, in a slower link, right? So, so the time scale, right, is, oh, you, you get a file somewhere in another stub and maybe it takes a minute or two hop by hop or a couple minutes to go to the transit network. And maybe it takes about 30 seconds through the transit network and then maybe it takes another couple minutes through, through the next stub network and everything is random depending on, oh, how short the paths are, right? Okay, so, uh, uh, users, they have a stay time when they show up at, at an access point of uh, numbers like 3 minutes to 1,500 seconds. That's like, I can't do the math at the moment because I'm pretty good at talking or thinking, but I can't really do both. So, so um, uh, 1,800 seconds, I think, is, is uh, 30 minutes. So it's something like 3 minutes to 25 minutes, I think. Okay, so... Then the away time, well, we chose an away time. It's an exponential random variable each time we go away, but it's, it's uh, 10 minutes is, is the away time. So, so, so we've chosen net numbers, right, which are specifically designed so that sometimes files are delivered and sometimes they're not, right? That's, that's the idea. Okay. So, uh, so, so here's a policy we implemented for cash pricing, which it'll turn out doesn't actually work. So, so stay time is from 18, 180 to 1,500 seconds and, and uh, has this exponential distribution. And we decided to set an acceptable price, which just varies linearly from uh, short, short stay time users, the minimum, they, they're willing to pay a very high price. And people who, who stay a long time, they, they're willing to pay zero for <laughs> caching, right? They pay for nothing. So, uh, so, so here is kind of the, the kind of results we get here. So, so at the very top, um, this is the no caching case. Nothing gets cached in the network. So, so 3.5 is, is um, the number of retrieval attempts you have to make to get your file on average. Right? So, so roughly it's about a third of the time when you try to go and get a file, you get the file. It takes about three and a half attempts. Uh, down here at the very bottom is something called ideal. Ideal is um, the case where the caches are infinitely large, everything's cached everywhere, and uh, the result of this idealized world where you, you cache always along the way, and whenever you reconnect, you find the, the, the closest cache who has your file. Um, you save something like, you go from three and a half attempts to like uh, 1.7 attempts, so, so, so um, the question is, is this a good thing, like a big decrease or a small decrease? And I would argue it's a big decrease because roughly, right, the number of retrieval attempts is cut in half. And retrieval attempts are not like um, in the time scale of, of networks. It's not like, oh, suddenly we've gone from three and a half milliseconds to 1.7 milliseconds, right? We've gone from three and a half units of trials, or maybe each one is a 10 minute event to, to 1.7. So, um, uh, so, so the fact is, the, the down here, there, when you have really big caches, uh, you get some value from having these copies distributed around the network. That's yes. Isn't it tempo just a few bytes though, versus the gigabyte or thirty that you want to download? No. So the, 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 when you say the attempts have gone down, right? It's really the perceived user delay that's gone down. So, so the, think about what happens to this user. He, he goes past an access point, right? And, and he, he gets the file or he doesn't, right? And then maybe 10 minutes later, he tries another one, right? right. So, so it's on that time scale that you make this statement. So, so now, right, uh, in between, right, here we have uh, this every node <coughs> caching. So every node caching, when, when, the, when the, um, uh, the storage sizes of the caches are very small, every node caching is is not so good. Right? What's happening here is that that uh, files are getting discarded before before people reconnect. Right? Uh, when the caches are very big, uh, every you know 
the every node caching works great. Right? It's as good as this, you know, uh, in our network, this is like infinity cache. Uh, uh, finally, so uh, in between, right, there's this last node caching. Last node caching, it turns out, is very effective uh, when the caches are small. So if you're going to choose one place to cache an object, uh, the last place you were, if you're just going to cache it in one extra place, is generally a good place to do it. Uh, uh, a little worse than that, and, and now here, the, there's, a, there's two, two dots. There's a green circle and a red X, right? I'm oh, sorry, and a blue triangle, you know, and a plus. So, so the green circle is this price-based caching mechanism, and in these slightly stupidly designed experiments, right, which is just because it's uh, ongoing work, this price-based mechanism and the random caching, which is called CP here, I think it's, why is it called CP? Uh, it's uh, cache probability, yes. cache <laughs> probability, yes. Uh, they work actually identically. So it turns out our pricing mechanism wasn't able to differentiate between the people with short stay time and long stay time. And essentially, it, they, they both randomly uh, uh, did a pretty good job here, right, of, of, of thinning the traffic and making caches useful better than, than uh, caching everywhere. But, but eventually, right, it works the same as caching everywhere when the caches are big. Uh, so uh, one last slide of, of kind of results you get. So, so you look at these cache retrieval ratios. This is the, the fraction of files that when they reconnect to the network, what fraction are delivered from the cache. And, and uh, last note caching is kind of very stable. It's 80% of the files typically. Right? Because you get a choice of the original or the last node. And something about the geometry of our network puts the file at the last node caching is a little bit, a little bit better of a location to retrieve from. Uh, and, and once again, our, our, our random caching and our price-based caching, they work identically. Yeah, they kind of do the same thing roughly as, as last node caching. Uh, when the buffers are small, when the buffers are big, it works like caching everywhere. Because pretty much when the buffers are big, they do cache everywhere. So, so um, uh, this is work in progress. Um, where uh, our view is that actually, um, uh, if we work on this, we might devise some policies that use these pricing mechanisms and, and, and maybe use some other kinds of local rules that will make this caching be, uh, uh, enhance the performance of it. Uh, I will say this, that when you do these experiments, your mileage will vary uh, very significantly depending on what the network topology is and what the user mobility is. Uh, these things make a big difference. You can design experiments where caches are useful, like fairly useful, like these here, and in other cases, they're, they're completely worthless. Um, this idea of cache pricing policies it, um, really needs some more study. Like, like if we think this, this user selection mechanism, we haven't really kind of carefully tried to analyze how you should, you should set this pricing to, to facilitate the uh, the highly mobile users. Um, there's a kind of complicated interaction, which also they've worked out between sort of the, the user's acceptable prices and the cash price um, that the router sets. Right. So, so um, uh, the gist of it is this: that uh, uh, when the router sets a lower price, it, it caches more objects. Right. And if it has a very big buffer, then um, it, it changes the where the the files are subsequently delivered from. So it, ch it actually changes the, the paths the files follow through the network because more things come from the cache. And, uh, and the, the price you set on the other hand depends on the traffic through each node. So, so there's an interaction there that uh, um, uh, needs more work. Um, and, and then maybe. Um, uh, you'd like to combine cash pricing and last router caching. Maybe the cash price would be a, a, a thing that's combined with just do you, for a certain price, do caching at the last router. And, and finally, maybe you'd like to do some, some local neighborhood cash coordination or some more fancier uh, caching decision mechanisms. Uh, uh, we've, had, we've given some thought to, uh, and actually written some papers about having caching instructions in, in complex ways buried in these files. 
Like only cache is file if you've done five hops in a different cache before. That kind of thing. And, and you can imagine many other kinds of sort of sort of deluxe rules that you could have read. Uh, 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 so so um, there's a variety of possibilities. So I'll stop here and uh, uh, take questions. So we also have some differentiation of who want to pay higher price so we'll get better results and more. Yeah, so the specifics of the experiments I just described, right, mm -hmm. is, is that um, when a mobile user is created, he's mm -hmm. created as a user with a certain kind of uh, velocity or mobility, right? What that means is that he's a user who at each subsequent uh, visit to an access network, Right, yeah. will have he chooses this random variable, the exponential for his access time, but he only chooses it once at the beginning of his of his travels. Okay. Right. So so some people are fast and some are slow. Uh -huh. So the people who are fast, they set a high acceptable price, and people who are slow set yeah. a low <coughs> acceptable price. Right. Uh -huh. So there's a randomization uh -huh. of what prices the the files have attached to them that depends on the randomization of whether users are fast or slow. So the faster users, like, uh, do they still get uh, like the same result as the slower users? In this case, they do, yeah. And we're, we, to tell you the truth, we're not completely sure why, but um, I think it's because, I mean, it, what it's showing is that somehow the way we chose the pricing didn't really differentiate. Okay. Right? But we're not completely sure why. So, so Ashton had his hand up before you. No, so there's, I, I left out something in the description. The, uh, there's a model where um, uh, there's a first a probability that you stay in the stub network, which I think is either 0.8 or 0.2. 0.2, Schwager says. Oh, in the right? stub network. So, so there's some probability you stay local, but when you don't stay local, you randomly jump to some other, some other node and some other stub. Uh, Leo, yeah. So uh, surprisingly, your results show that this pri pricing scheme does not really work. Could it be attributed to the fact that you chose this linear dependency on the price versus the... Yeah, sure. Um, so if, for example, exponential might show you can use some different profile, would it make yes. a difference? Oh, so, so I'll tell you next week. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, I had a little uh, trouble sort of with this basic premise of mobile disconnected. I think it should be connected. Uh, you should have mobile broadband coverage everywhere. But OK, uh, uh, that part I said, I mean, do you use any sort of uh, neighborhood relations? You know, if you know that you've been in farm place, you know that where mobiles are moving, do you use that in the strategies? Or? No. So, so um, in, in essence, right, you maybe could say, oh, that could be some kind of local information. And, um, uh, and to some degree, right, it's last node caching is exploiting that. The reason that last node caching is effective is that typically the file shoots through the transit network and gets somewhere into the, into the, the local stub, right? And then, and then the person leaves. Right, and the extent to which, if you if you choose a mobility model that exploits locality, like oh, if they're here, the next place they'll be is like a block or two away, right? Then so then, then you really last node caching works really well, right? So uh, 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 you know, but on the other hand, if you have some other wacky model, it's that's part of your mileage may vary depending on how you choose parameters. Yeah, yeah, now it's, um, my talk was supposed to... Yeah, thank you. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs>